First of all, let's bring David Davis into the conversation. Lovely to see you, you. on Morning. this Sunday morning. Now, the newspapers don't make for great reading for the Conservative Party. We've got the Sunday Mirror exposed... I picked a great morning to come on. I tell you what, yeah, great. Um, the Sunday Mirror has exposed <laughs> these people partying at CCHQ in December 2020. We've got Bernard Jenkin seemingly having gone to a birthday party around the same time when the Deputy Speaker of the House of Commons, Eleanor Lang, referred to it as a business meeting, not in anyone's uh, minds who are watching GB News or listening to the radio. We've got James Warburton now having stood down from Somerset and Froome. That's a fourth by-election for mm. steadying the ship Rishi Sunak. I put it to Michael Gove earlier and I'll put it to you. The ship's sinking, isn't it? <laughs> Interest rates at 6%. You were a minister in 97. I think you were Europe minister back then. Yeah, yeah. Are we seeing 1997 all over again? No, David? I don't think we are. I mean, it's pretty stormy. I mean, as you say, st <laughs> steady. Stormy? Steady. Crikey. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. <laughs> it's, go it's going to test, it's going to test Rishi's uh, nautical skills, shall we say. But it's pretty stormy. But no, it's, it's manageable. Look, I came into the parliament in 87, one year after Margaret Thatcher lost Rydale, a yes. spectacular loss, and it went from 20-odd uh, thousand majority to, I think, minus 6,000 or something. Yes. Uh, and then the very next year, we got it back again, you know, and, and we got returned. Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about the by-elections. They'll be embarrassing, difficult, they'll cause problems with Do you with think momentum. you'll win any, any of them? Oh, I don't know. It's very hard to tell. Um, it depends if they all happen at the same time or not, because, yeah. I mean, even... The, the, the day we lost Rydale, we hung on to a Derbyshire one. Yes. You know, and, and then they're both safe seats. So it's very hard to tell. I don't think they indicate much, really. They're, they're sort of uh, demonstrator battlefields, but they're not real predictors of outcomes. They never have been. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, they're, they're no doubt about it. I mean, the, the but news, your chances as you say, in very, 2024 very poor. are looking, looking bad. Yes, Look, we've got a very uh, slim chance of pulling this back. I think we, I, I think we have a, a modest chance. I wouldn't say it's a majority. I'd say it's probably a two-thirds chance of not winning. Half of it Labour winning, half of it mm. uh, a, a no overall control, a hung parliament, and, and us perhaps with a third chance But of what winning. do you blame that on? Because I know you were the one of the first to call <clears throat> Boris Johnson to go. Mm. Um, you know, you can blame Boris Johnson. Lots of people watching and listening to this will be blaming the lack of conservatism in the Conservative Party, which must frustrate somebody like you. Well, it does. But, I mean, the, the, the first thing you, you've got to be careful not to forget is the turmoil we're already in, the sort of objective turmoil, whether it's the, the COVID, whether it's the Ukraine war, whether it's the run-up of international interest yeah. rates, all those things together. But, but Rishi Sumat's meant to steady this ship in very choppy waters, yeah. and we're now looking at interest rates of 6%. Yeah. You know, there's a big focus on how it affects the household finances. Yeah. You're right, a former rightly. businessman. Rightly. How does it affect businesses, David? Oh. We're going to be seeing foreclosures on people's homes, and we're going to be seeing businesses fold, because there's no way... I mean, the government's expressed surprise this week that there's wage inflation. Well, the government put the minimum wage up by 9.2%. Yeah. What is it? Some of this is idiotic. You know, the corporation tax increase. Corporation tax increase and what profits? Well, I what, mean... You, yeah, be careful, because you, corporation tax with, with super deductions and so on, it's not necessarily quite as clear as it looks. But you're right, I'm a low-tax Tory. I would prefer a lower tax strategy. I want to see, I'm hoping this autumn, we're going to have an autumn budget and the beginnings of a reduction in taxes. But the, but the, your, your point about steadying the ship, we need Rishi more now than ever because of all that, all what, that turmoil. Globalist, technocratical Rishi who may <coughs> be taken hostage by the Treasury? No, I don't think so. I, don't, I think he's the last person to be taken hostage by the Treasury. He's, he's one person who can actually argue with them and stand up to them. OK, well, let's yeah. use an example. There's a story in the paper about people wanting to go against this idea of being in this band of countries that are in this minimum corporation tax ban. They think it's anti-growth, that we shouldn't be aligning ourselves with people with historically high corporation tax rates. The whole point of Brexit was that we went alone. Yeah. And they well, were more Singaporean, and that hasn't happened. Well, I, I, to be honest, I have some sympathy with them, but there is, but there, but it's not as simple as it sounds. Because I think the idea was to have a minimum corporation tax of fifteen percent. Well, one of the effects of that would be to bring Luxembourg, Ireland, the Netherlands, and other countries, and indeed uh, some of our independent territories, into the same uh, uh, box that we're in. Because we lose quite a lot of trade to Ireland, for example, mm. because it has a lower... So it would, it would equalise that. So it's, it's not quite as simple as it looks, but I do actually be believe that in the long term, interest... Uh, sorry, uh, corporation tax rate competition is good for the world at large. So I 
I think... Uh, but you'd rather our tax rate was lower, right? I'd rather tax rate was lower. Of course I would. Do you agree uh, but, with but, Mark? But not, not, by, not by borrowing to do it, which was, which was the, which was the Liz Truss sure. project. What's your reaction to Mark Carney again having a go at Brexit and blaming Brexit for high inflation? Well, I, you know, I've been laughing out loud this week. What with Mark Carney and the KC at the, uh, the COVID yes, thing? Yes, COVID's oh, Brexit's <laughs> fault. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, it's just madness. And what, what you're seeing is, I think, what, I think what a social psychologist called confirmatory bias. Yeah. People who want to believe Brexit's a terrible thing look round and, and pick, oh, that went wrong, that's Brexit. They don't look and see that our service exports have gone up by the highest in the G7, mm. the highest in Europe, and pretty much the highest in the world, yeah. that we've got high employment levels and so on and so on. So how on. much of it, inflationary measures particularly, are the Bank of England's fault? Uh, I, I mean, think, including I, Mark Carney. He's I the one who presided Well, over. I think historically there's no doubt that, uh, that what every country in the world went in for, quantitative easing, has been a feeder to core inflation. Mm. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Uh, and there were reasons for it at the time. You know, just as during COVID we had to spend money that we didn't have, bluntly, uh, to keep things going, we're now having to pay the price of that. So, yeah, the banks had the banks had a, 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 a role in this. You know, frankly, I would have had a different bank governor years mm. back. You know, but are you disappointed with how Brexit's worked out? No, not Do you yet. think the government's no, 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 done no, no, enough no, to maximise no, the opportunity? Not yet. No, no, it hasn't. No, they're, they're, those are two different questions. Okay, answer um, both. <laughs> answer to one, no, because we, you know this is only the second year, really, in the midst of crises galore yeah. on a global scale. Has the government done enough? No, it hasn't. Um, it, indeed, I think the government missed some chances during the COVID period when it could have been planning things and it wasn't really working hard enough. But, uh, but you know, also, you, you, you know, listen, I resigned because yeah. I thought the original strategy was wrong. Yeah. And th that meant we had to pull, that pull, talking about turning ocean liners, mm. we had to pull the whole ocean liner back. And to be fair to Boris, he did start that process. So it hasn't been done as well as it should be. Is it, is it, has it failed? Certainly not, no. I mean, as I say, some of the economic numbers that people don't say to you on our overall growth rate, better than Europe, uh, on uh, service levels, which is the biggest part, 80% mm -hmm. of the economy, uh, we're doing really, really well. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of things we're doing well. And, and of course, you know, whether it's vaccines or Ukraine, our independence has actually worked both to our advantage and to the world's advantage. Um, although still the news agenda is dominated by all things blonde and Boris-ish. <laughs> How are you going to vote tomorrow? Uh, if there's a vote, I will vote to support the committee. Um, and the reason for that is I've actually read the report. Yeah. I mean, it's 30,000 words. Are you confident that Harriet Harman was a neutral arbiter in all this, having, yes. and having reason, tweeted that yeah, she thought I know. Boris look, misled look, Parliament? Let's, let's understand something about this. I mean, people like uh, Rhys Mogg, argue you know, very strongly about the importance of Parliament. Boris argues about it. And one of the things about Parliament is it's the highest court in the land. Yeah. That creates a problem when you're coming to privileges. What's that problem? It's like having a trial in a village. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Nobody is entirely unbiased. Anybody in, in the whole mm. thing. And this, is, this was true with Boris too. I mean, uh, uh, people took views on either side of the divide. Now, what's important about this report, and I recommend to your viewers, if they really care about this, actually read it. Yeah. Uh, because it, what they do uh, is they take six cases. They, they say to Boris, the last 16, the ones involving checkers and so on, they just take Boris's word for it. Yeah. They take six cases, and where, five of which he was actually at the parties, and go through them piece by piece and say, did he know about this? Did he know about them? Did he attend? But he's arguing, how do they know his own mind at the time? They don't have to. They don't, they don't, what they know is what he knows. Yeah. If, you, if you go to a party, you know it was a party. You don't need an advisor to tell you. And if, and if your readers, if your viewers don't have time to read the whole thing, just read about the eight uh, paragraphs from 109 onwards. Yeah, okay. And they'll see what I mean. Do what journalists do. Really... Just read the conclusion. <laughs> well, it's not the conclusion, because in the conclusion they say, look yeah. at paragraph this for that, look yeah, at paragraph yeah. that. It's a, it's a very, very carefully argued report. So, in a way, that means almost... Having said that, though, David, yeah. this is slightly contradictory, because I remember having mm. conversations with you about the process that Owen Paterson faced, and there's been criticisms, David Warburton said today, that standards process yeah. is Kafkaesque, and you were concerned about it. So MPs investigating MPs doesn't always work out that way. The irony, well, of course... Uh, Patterson wasn't a full privileges committee, yeah. it was a standards. Yes, you know, yes, so it had some and lay I people as well. I actually went to see Boris in spring of 2021 and said, Boris, you need to fix this system. 
and... And he didn't. Right. He didn't. Because so it was somebody else involved. It wasn't him involved. All he right. didn't do anything about it. One more question about a system that could be fixed. Yeah. Resignation honours. Honours in general, David. I mean, the, the ennobling and indeed the awarding of awards to people. I mean, two of them have been caught out in the CCHQ saw, video. Ben uh, Mallet and uh, horrible. Sean Thanks Bailey. Skin crawl. Who's this Charlotte Owen who was a secretary to Boris for about five minutes and is now a member of the House I of I think Lords. they call him executive assistants. Something like that. <laughs> um, what's going on? Should we just scrap resignation on us? I don't know. I'm, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, look, what's the point of a resignation on I mean, it sounds like an, an anachronism. What it is normally is prime ministers at the end of their time in office rewarding a few people, yes. notably a few people, who have All right. been so above... All right, so cap on numbers. Above, maybe. That may be a good maybe idea. Maybe three. Maybe a good idea. Five. Oh, a dozen, maybe, but, you know... A dozen? Yeah, well, look, I mean, how many people work in number 10? 400, believe it or not, now. But, you know, but the point being, it's, it allows them to reward people who've, who've acted above and beyond yes. in the public interest. But this dates from the days, as it were, when politicians were gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it's that not... no longer the case, <laughs> Well, you must draw... Your, your viewers must draw uh, their own conclusions. Yeah, w will you get knighted at some point? I don't think so. Not by Boris Johnson, but maybe you've supported Rishi Sunak. No, it doesn't. It doesn't well, it's, it's, let, let me put it this way. I haven't rushed to be knighted or rushed to accept any offers. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Not Sir David Davis. <laughs> thank you for joining me in the studio this morning. Always lovely to see you. Thank you. Now.